Hello, dear and loyal audience. Thank you for being patient with the cliffhanger last week. We hope you enjoy part two with Lash LaRue. so freaking bad wrestle me when i've trained guys and i've talked to guys and walked through things with them in the ring and, and try to explain psychology of a match to them the most beautiful and the most elegant and the most simplistic way i think to explain that is to talk about the punch yes because you take a punch in a wrestling match if you and i just square up and we're starting off and we start jawing and this is a big match and i may hit you with a boom and you may hit me back and then boom, and now we're off to the races. The way you sell that punch is going to be different there, where if we're in the heat spot and you can hit me with that exact same punch, boom, and I might sell it for miles, and I'm just, and I, I may milk that for 45 seconds off that one punch. It's the exact same punch, but it's where I've placed it in the match and what I'm trying to get from the fans yes. versus in the comeback. Boom, boom, boom hit the ropes, come off with something else. But now there's a little bit more fire and there's a little bit more urgency and there's a little bit more intensity to it. Dude, it's the exact same punch. You know, that's listening to – that. that's talking back to the fans. That's telling you where I'm placing it in the match matters. How I want you to react to it matters. How I'm reacting to it matters. You know, that that's what carries these fans on this roller coaster ride where it's not all one – because the – the, the other issue that you run into that and the other problem that you run into in a wrestling match, if you're not careful, is even if you're doing these great hot spots and they're high energy hot spots and they're it's tremendous moves, it can be boring because that's still the same level. The level yeah. just happens to be up here instead of down here, but it's still mm -hmm. not changing. There's still if anything, it's worse for the guys working because if the crowd yeah. is reacting, why you, why, dude, another punch in the bump card. Pop, 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 pop. I had a, I had a uh, match with Ray Mysterio Jr. one time on a, on a house show, on a non-televised show. And Arn Anderson was the agent on the, on the show. And, yeah, just tremendous guy. And I was always wanted to know exactly what Arn thought about every match that we had. Did and, he carry uh, a Glock back then? <laughs> no, he didn't have to. He carried the clap. <laughs> have you ever right. heard about the clap? Oh, I've seen – I, can't, I don't think I should but say that publicly. He, uh, oh, he, we were on a, we were on a bus one time, and for whatever reason, he got hot at disco, and he tried to slap disco, but he hit him with the one hand, and you couldn't tell because of the way his hand was whether he had slapped him or clapped him across the face, and we just you know you couldn't tell if it was a claw or a slap, so we just called it the clap. Boom, right across the face. So, but anyway, so Ray and I had a great match, a phenomenal match, and I went came back and I asked Arn uh, what he thought. He goes, great match, tremendous match, but you guys work too hard. I said, what do you mean work too hard? He goes, you could have you could accomplish the exact same thing, got the same reaction from the fans, and done half as many moves. And he was absolutely right. I mean, yes. and Arn's phenomenal that way. I mean, he's a master storyteller when it comes to it. You know, and and those old school guys like that, they understood that and they got it because if you go too fast, if you go too fast in a match and you have too many high spots, you lose the drama. You lose the storytelling. There's a storytelling that takes place with your facial expressions and with your movement and where you place things in a match. And, you know, Shawn Michaels was notorious for you would you would lay there on a match after a double down, yeah. you know, lay there on the mat. And, and he would tell you, you, you want to start working your way up and work your way up, and the crowd would go completely dead. He would wait literally for the crowd to completely die and not make a noise. And you'd start trying to move because you're thinking, we got to get the crowd. So I'm listening to the crowd like you. I'm supposed to be listening to the crowd. They're not making any noise, so I better start moving. And you start moving. Not yet. What do you mean not yet? <laughs> he was going to completely bring them down and stop them because they've got nowhere to go but up from there. You know, and we forget yeah. those things sometimes. We just think if we're getting a reaction, then we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. That's not always true. Sometimes a non-reaction is a reaction. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's a hard, uh, that's a good point because that's a hard thing to gauge if you're working in like Japan where the crowds are notoriously silent, you know, yes. like 
or even the pandemic era. Strutton was talking about earlier, you know, like I can't even imagine, you know, kudos to AEW, the men and women who were able to really, I think they did it probably the best out of any company that was doing that shit. And even with WWE having the, the damn trons with everybody on there, you know, like impact. Right, what is killing about this? It too. Yeah. All right, what about this? What about when you're having a match that's been completely laid out for you ahead of time? Without even considering how the crowd's gonna react to everything. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, a, it, a, Cause then you're just kind of guessing. You're guessing and you're going, well, what if they react to something totally different? Because I've been in situations before where you could be the biggest baby face in the world and you go wrestle in Philadelphia and they may heal on you in a heartbeat. Oh yeah. And then you better be ready to switch everything around 180 degrees. Oh yeah. What's uh speaking of that in like cities, dude, what was uh what some of the more notorious cities you worked in the uh, crowds like that, like Chicago crowds. I know they're dude. That's our area. They're hot. Philly is fucking some monsters. Chicago was there. Philly was Philly was great. I always believe it or not. I always thought Baltimore was a hot crowd. Yeah. I loved working in Baltimore. I loved wrestling in Baltimore. You know, and it was a different mentality. Uh, it was also more. I learned very quickly too regionally how to adjust how I wrestled based on where I was regionally. But so then smart, that also yeah. goes into that also goes into um, if you're smart enough and you're wise enough and you've been around the block a little bit, you can sprinkle in some of that magic dust from a different territory, for lack of a better way of putting it, bring it in there. And now suddenly the crowd is seeing something they've never seen before. I'll give you an example of that. You guys just got through telling me you're from like the, the Indiana, close to Chicago type area place up there right i used to go into south bend and wrestle a yeah. small promoter promotion you know in the mid 2000s and i was doing a lot of stuff down here in the south where i'm from at the time and i grew up there on continental championship wrestling and georgia championship wrestling yeah. and that Memphis gaga style man and so much of it was really just uh entertainment as much as it was anything else, you know, good yeah. Jerry Lawler type of entertainment, Jeff Jarrett stuff, man, was just great. Bullet Bob Armstrong down here in the stuff. Bob. Bullet Bob Armstrong, man, the Armstrongs might as well have, been, he might as well have been Hulk Hogan when I was a kid in the Alabama territory here. He was and huge. Love those guys. Yeah, yeah. And I was fortunate because Brad was my best friend in the wrestling business. And that's who I traveled with. That's awesome. So I learned, I learned that style well, and I learned how to really interact with the crowd and entertain the crowd from that standpoint. I also knew enough and realized that when I got to places in the Midwest or got up around Chicago or even in the Northeast in some places, they wanted to see more mat wrestling and chain wrestling. They come from that heavy amateur background, right? Yeah. And I was an amateur wrestler, so I could do all that stuff. And so I would chain wrestle, chain wrestle. And I remember I got to South Bend, and I just wanted to have some fun one night, man. And I get in there, and I actually think I was wrestling sharp board. And we get in there. And, yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. shell, yeah. yeah. Yeah, So we go in there, we're wrestling, and I'm doing some chain wrestling stuff, and boom, 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 boom. And, uh, and I get one over on doing an arm drag. He powders out of the ring. And when he powders out of the ring, I spin around and did the fight in Irish gimmick, right? Totally. <laughs> oh, Chris I got a move. And the crowd pops and goes crazy on it. Comes back in, we're chain wrestling some more, chain wrestling some more. And I went, <laughs> and put the claw on it, right in the middle of all of it, right? It's a little guy guy sprinkled in. The crowd goes nuts. They pop. They go crazy. We do some other chain wrestling, some high spots and stuff in there. And they come back around. He goes to give me a hip toss. I block it, float over, go to give him a hip toss, blocks it, float over. He goes to give it to me again. And when he blocks at that time, I give up on the hip toss and just – twist his nipples and pick him up and he hang, hands off to my wrist and I toss him over the top rope. Now that's stuff that you would Ooh. normally reserve for Memphis, but yeah. because they don't see it that often in the Midwest, they went crazy on it. It's new, it's fresh, it's different. You know, they, I gave them what they came to see with the chain wrestling showed that I could do it, added that in there. And now the entertainment value went from the roof for them. You know, that's psychology. That's listening to the crowd and talking to the crowd. Hell yeah. That it is, brother. Hey, as we wind down the wrestling, I want to, uh, I'd kind of like to know, what do you think? I mean, because, dude, I like I said, you know, you're, you're notorious for your WCW run, you know, the Misfits yeah. in action, um, being a tag team champion, dude, in the cruiserweight division. That shit was, that was fire, dude. Like, like I said, like, back in the day, like, you and Jericho, and then obviously, like, Malenko and Benoit Mysterio, th those were my favorite guys, man. Um, but, you know, you hit TNA after that, the WWE thing. 
everything combined in your wrestling career, what would you say is like your, your greatest moment? Like what, what's the one thing all these years later, even the years in it or out that still to this day, you're like, man, shit, that was the best. Like this was my greatest time. I don't give a fuck what anybody thinks. This was the most fun I've had doing this thing. There, there was a few, there was a few and, and uh, right out the gate would have been my debut on nitro in Minneapolis, which was another great crowd with, with Billy Kidman. And the way that came about was, man, I was doing the Saturday night shows and I was just having good matches. And I went from, and and this is probably a little bit of masterclass to a lesson in guys that are breaking into the business and going, what I got to do to get people's attention, but work hard and do what you're supposed to do and give guys great matches. Give them everything that you've got with no ego involved at all. Make them look good because if the match gets over, you get over whether you went over in the match or not. And my mentality was always, I had that time between the curtain and the ring to get some attention from the fans, even if I'm not going to get anything in the match, right? So I wanted to make some kind of connection with the sideburns build and the ooh-wee and the whole build and the throwing out market. <laughs> yeah. And so, yes. you know, and I came up with all that stuff on my own, you know, and I just yeah. did not want to be denied. I put Raging Cajun on my tights, not because they made me the Raging Cajun, because I made myself the Raging Cajun, and I figured the announcers, if they see that on my tights, are going to mention it, and they did. So anyway, I'm having Monday, I'm having the Saturday night shows, and uh, these guys that are just beating me up every week are going in asking to wrestle me because they know they're going to have good matches, and they know I'm going to give them everything that I've got. And they start requesting me so much that now all of a sudden they're giving me some good matches because they respect me and appreciate how I'm shining them up. So they want to help shine me up. Now I'm beating some guys that are a little bit lower on the card and instead of just being at the very bottom. And that starts building me up and building up some momentum. And, and meanwhile, the, the office, the, the bookers, they can see what I could do. And they called me at the power plant on a Friday and said, we'd like for me to come out and wrestle Billy at Nitro. Can you be at Nitro on Monday night? Well, of course, I'm, are you kidding me? I've been waiting to be at Nitro on Monday night. Yeah. Thanks for calling. Uh, <laughs> that was just the time that they were just feeding guys to Billy Kidman yeah. Build up his credibility as a cruiserweight champion. By that time, I'd had all this time on Saturday nights, and Billy knew me, and Billy sent me work, and Billy knew what I could do. And instead of him going out there and just beat me up, he had a good 50 50 match with me. And I got some of my character in because I had developed my character by then. They weren't expecting that. And so suddenly I went from just being a guy at the power plant that got to work on the on you know the TV tapings. To they didn't say a word to me. They didn't sit down with me. There was no planning involved. They just started sending me booking sheets like they did the other guys and started sending me airline tickets. And suddenly I'm one of the guys on the main roster, you know, and yeah. I'm on the road. So that was very meaningful to me. And the next thing I know, I'm in this feud with Disco Inferno, and I had my very first pay per view. Yeah, at MGM Grand, man, in Ooh-wee. Las Vegas. And I'm a huge Elvis fan. You probably see yes. Elvis Presley Boulevard over my Dude, we're gonna, I wanted to talk about that's why I wanted to cut the wrestling shit. <laughs> yeah. But shoot, go. Hey, well, that's where that, by the way, really quickly, that's where the L shaped sideburns came from. I kind of figured because Glenn started, Danzig does the same thing and he's a huge Elvis fan. Yeah. Well, when when I started know. at uh, at WCW, they told me I had really short hair because I always kept my hair short when I was young. In fact, I didn't know it would be this curly until I started growing it out, right? I retired, but my <laughs> hair did not. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> they, they said, look, you need to grow your hair out because you look like a kid. You look like that kid from the movie Rudy. So grow your hair out. <laughs> Rudy. Grow your hair. Yeah. So I grew out the L shape. I grew out the big pork chop sideburns like Elvis. And I looked in the mirror one day and said, I bet I could shave those into L's. And that's where the L's were born. And uh, but anyway, we get to the Las Vegas to wrestle Halloween Havoc. And uh, wow. and they pull up in a limo, and this is back again. The business was hot, so the mm-hmm. lobby is full of wrestling fans waiting to see the guys when they check in. And a lot of rats. He, well, the guy, the guy in the driving the limousine, he goes, uh, he goes, you want me to pull your pull your rat to the back? And I said, I guess. I mean, you know better than I do. This is all new to me, right? Right. right. So he pulls me around to the back of the MGM Grand. They have people meet me out there. They take me in through the loading docks down this long hallway behind the kitchen, they open up this big oak door that opened into this plush, like, kayfabe office with all these people working in there behind computers to check me in. And they said, this is the Elvis entrance. 
And I went, oh, man, I have arrived, right? <laughs> and the most nervous I've ever been in my life was uh, at Halloween Havoc, that opening match, man, on my very first pay-per-view. So that was another big moment. And then a big moment for me was winning the tag team titles in Australia with Chavo. And then finally, I would say another big one that I'll never forget because it meant so much personally. And I also knew how hard he'd worked was, was Hugh, Bill DeMott, when they, when they put the, uh, finally put the United States title on him. And it yeah. was legitimate. It was a legitimate show of emotion and support when that, when that locker room just organically uh, emptied out and everybody came out on the stage and kind of gave him a standing ovation on that show that night when he won that title. Uh, they were legitimately showing that kind of support. That wasn't something that was just written. They said, we think this makes good TV. That was a lot of people who respected him a great deal and loved him and thought that he finally got what he deserved, kind of came out and showed his support. And you could feel the emotion in that moment. Yeah. Dude, that's a great, <laughs> the greatest, like most selfless <laughs> answer. Like I could hear, I, I love hearing that shit. You know, like, <laughs> well, you, know you, you find out really quick, man, we're all, family in this thing man and yeah when we when we try to make one another better in the wrestling business the whole business man comes up you know this business is not built on the back of egos this yeah or jealousy or jealousy you know yeah yeah but you know for for better or for worse i would say even guys like and i'm not trying to speak to something personally that i don't know about personally but you even take some of your legendary feuds of people like a like a Bret Hart and a, and a Shawn Michaels, they don't have the matches they had without some underlying respect underneath all that, right? Because there's yeah, so much professional respect. Yeah, yeah. Like, yes, one hundred percent, man. And, and uh, I think that that's when the the most beautiful aspects of the wrestling business comes out. And if somebody doesn't have that deep inside of them, then I think they very quickly get pushed out of the wrestling business. If you yeah. ever wonder why somebody disappears quickly, often times it's just because people didn't want to work with them yeah but not everybody can be a you know gino hernandez you know mafia yeah. tire or whatever <laughs> can all be dark side yeah dude that's that's so fucking crazy um i i just really appreciate the brotherhood of pro wrestlers like you said i come from dude i do vocals in a extreme heavy metal band and i've been doing the metal gig like music professionally for about 20 years now it's crazy to think but it's the same deal as wrestling. You travel up and down the roads, dude, and you meet uh, brothers in bands, different bands. And, like, don't get me wrong, I always had the mentality to go out there and kill every night. You know, I don't care if I'm playing with, like, the biggest band that I've ever been a fan of. I'm going to go out there and destroy them. But there's still that professional courtesy and respect, you know, and that brotherhood. And, like, all right, I know now if I come out to this town, we're cool. We can hang out. You can crash each other's pad or whatever and stay there. And just that the stuff that you carry with you through life, you know, friendship and stuff. And like, I'm very real in that aspect. And I like and appreciate the fact that you can share stuff like that and about the wrestling yeah. business, you know? Absolutely. That's why the wrestling business is also unique in the sense that in the, in the same way you can, you can step away from the wrestling business and be away from it for 15 years. Like I was man, or 12 years and step right back into it. And it's the guys that were truly your brothers and the guys that truly loved you and you loved them, man, they step right back in. It's like you saw each other last week, you know, yeah. or you could talk on the phone for the first time in a, in, in a few years. And it's like no time passed whatsoever. It's that way with me and Chavo. It's that way with me and you. It's that way with me and Brian Armstrong and Scott Armstrong and all those guys and Dr. Tom Pritchard. Hell yeah. And then, man, you're, you're kind of cut from the same mold you know, and you can step right back into that void and you think, man, what an awesome, wonderful thing it is to be a part of that fraternity. And it's made, and make no mistake, it's that fraternity. And the life-changing moment for me is we started this thing talking about Chris Canyon. And it's almost as if it's one thing to make it through the power plant. It's, it's another thing to give them a check and then start your training and say, okay, we'll train you to be a wrestler. It's another thing to have someone like a Chris Canyon invite you into the ring. You have a match with them, and you had that first match. He didn't invite me into the ring and invite me into a first match. He invited me into a brotherhood that now I have been honored and privileged to be a part of my entire life now, and I will never not be one of the boys because of that. You know, yeah. when it all comes down to it, I'm a wrestler. 
man, I'm a rush. I wear so many different hats now. I'm a pastor. We talked about that. And then, you know, I'm going to give you absolvent at some point about your language. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> we're not. No, I'm teasing. But, uh, but, you know, I'm a pastor now. I'm in ministry. I, I work with a lot of youth. I do my freelance artwork, man. And that's predominantly where my income comes from. I do these caricatures. I'm an artist. All these things, man. But in my heart, You'll never get rid of that warrior mentality. You'll never get rid of that fighting spirit. You'll never not be a wrestler if you were ever a wrestler to begin with. Oh yeah, for sure. And I, dude, I don't. Have you ever been to the California Alley Club or the California? God damn it, the Cauliflower. I can't say that word. Cauliflower. Really. Yeah, cauliflower. cauliflower. Cauliflower Alley. The, I have not. Yeah, have you ever been out there? No, I have not. I'm very familiar with it, but I've never been invited out. That's like some. Like me and Sretton have tossed around the idea. We'd like to interview a lot, like try to set up some and interview like all these legends and people that are a part of the club. And just like a uh, shout out to Sam Adonis, who's a great indie pro wrestler, Corey Graves, brother from uh, WWE. Dude, he's been there numerous times. Um, it's it's this brotherhood and it's generational. You know, sure. like we're talking, that's the great. That's the most beautiful part to me as a Absolutely. fan is is all these generations you know your your grandpa's favorite wrestler is there with your dad's favorite who's there you're there with your favorite you know like that's just special that's and wrestling does this thing like that dude it brings yeah, people together whether you're working or you're watching brother hey i'll give you give you an example it's, it's very often i'll get asked now and I, i've stayed booked up enough with my live events when it comes to doing caricatures because I'll do wedding receptions, I do college campuses, I do uh, Christmas parties. I mean, I do anything in any kind of event that you can imagine, fairs and festivals and all these kind of jazz, man. If people ask me, where are you going to be tomorrow night? Well, I got to look at my calendar. Well, what kind of event is it? I'm, I'm not quite sure yet, but it's always the same job, right? I'm drawing funny pictures and get paid for it. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a great gig from that standpoint. Well, the truth of the matter is for all the picking apart that we do and all the psychology we talk and all the different generations of wrestling and what the business and the product looks like now versus what it looked like before and the different movesets that people have now versus what they had before and what's the best way to do this the best way to do that at the end of the day is still all wrestling man and at the end of the day it's still the same job whether you're dusty rolls the american dream or whether you're mgaf you're doing the same job man and, and then you're you're exactly right that's a brotherhood and a camaraderie that covers all generations dude and it's so great dude you're you're speaking about your your art and everything and I, i'm curious to know because dude you're a really great artist man and did you do some shit for magazines back in the day Oh, absolutely. Like well, PWI and wrestling. That was, my, that was my start. Okay, so so my start in the art thing is this. I always enjoyed drawing. Um, I'll, always was a a big part of who I am. I was always that kid that could draw. And I always tried to cultivate it. While I had a lot of fat friends that enjoyed drawing that would look at comic books and want to draw Batman and Superman and all these things. But I was yeah. the dude that was looking at bad magazines. Like that's what intrigued me because Mad Magazine would make fun of movies and TV shows. And for that to work, if they're spoofing Top Gun, then that cartoon character better look just like Tom Cruise so that I get it right out the gate. Right. Yeah. That blew my mind before I even knew what a caricature was. And so I really dove deep into Mad Magazine was a big fan my entire life of that kind of me parody too. and that kind of comedy. And that's just right in my wheelhouse. And that style I sort of cultivated and loved it. And then when I started WCW, around the same time that I started my training at the power plant, I had just taken a semester off of college to see if I could sell my cartoons because I realized after looking into it, man, magazines, which were a thing at the time that were made out of real paper, uh, <laughs> magazines didn't care. Yeah. No mas yeah. papel? Yeah. yeah. They, they didn't care if you had a degree. They just cared whether or not your work was good enough for them to publish. Yeah. So yeah. I began selling, I, I sent cartoon submissions out to different magazines just to see if anybody would buy it, if I'd get any buyers. And crazy enough, to tell you how close my career went to go in a different direction, right after I started training at the power plant and mm. right after I knew I was going to sort of make it and have an opportunity there, I sold a cartoon to Cat Fancy Magazine and I sold a cartoon to the Saturday Evening Post of all places, which was like, WrestleMania of cartooning, you know, at the time, you know, we, that's the, that is the magazine that Norman Rockwell did the covers for, for so many years. Yeah. You hell know? yeah. And so it, that was an awesome feeling, but I also thought, okay, 
how often can I keep selling to them? You know, and in wrestling, and also I felt that bug, so I enjoyed wrestling. But once I started on the road and I was on that heavy schedule of 300 days a year, you'd show up to a different town every night. And if it was a Monday Nitro or a Thursday Night Thunder, you'd have to be at the building at noon for a show that didn't go live until 7 p.m. So if you didn't have pre-tapes, yeah. if you didn't have local media to do, if you didn't have some kind of personal appearance or meet and greet that you were responsible for, you had a lot of downtime. Yeah, especially and, back in those days, there were no cell phones that are right. we have now. So yeah, yeah, guys were playing cards, you know. Yeah. And so, what do you uh, do? Yeah, I began carrying I be, began carrying dry race markers with me because every one of these locker rooms had whiteboards in the back. Yeah, yeah. And so I started drawing on the dry race boards. And the big fan of mine at the time that just meant so much to me. And the more I tell the story, the more it means to me now is Kurt Henning thought it was the greatest thing in the world that I could draw other people. Hey. Because that's right in his wheelhouse of wanting to rib everybody, right? So he would sit there and just be the instigator constantly. He'd go, okay, draw Hulk Hogan. Um, all right. <laughs> now, Again, now draw him, brother. Yeah, he's going, draw him really, really old. I'm going, <laughs> and he, he goes, okay. And he goes, he goes Nuclear draw, heat. Yeah, draw, draw, draw him with a walker and an oxygen mask. I'm going, oh. he's in the other room. He goes, <laughs> and he used this line that I, I still use now when I'm doing events and people ask me about my drawing. He'll go, look, you tell him you don't write the news. You just report the news. <laughs> and so I said, hey. okay. And, and he would just laugh. Kurt would just laugh. And, and Bill after saw my work while I was back there. And then also Ross Foreman, who was doing WCW magazine at the time. Saw right. work. And they both showed an interest in publishing me because they just thought it was cool that a wrestler could draw cartoons. And uh, I went with Ross and WCW magazine because I'm just a loyalist at heart. And that's the company I work for. So, of course, I want my art to be in WCW magazine. And my very first cartoon I ever drew, actually, I still have it. As a matter of fact, it was I had started, I was drawing just on topping paper, inking it old school, coloring it with magic markers and color pencils. And I would literally give the original to Ross, Ross Foreman, and uh, to go and make a copy of. And uh, the first one I ever drew was Bill Goldberg. And he had these huge traps that were so big they covered <laughs> yeah, up his dude. Yeah, they, covered, they were so, bigger than hawks from the yeah, LOD, dude. Right. Right, right. So he, uh, and that's with the shoulder pads on. No, right. So he he come up. Yeah. He, so he had a. I drew a little kid coming up and going, you know, asking for an autograph. And the caption was, "I'm sorry, kid. What'd you say your name was? My traps are in the way." <laughs> <laughs> so I walked over to Bill, you know, worried that I'm gonna get heat. It's my first cartoon that's gonna be published in the magazine. And I said, uh, "I said, hey, Bill. I just want to make sure you don't have a problem with this before they publish it." And he looked at it, and he looked at me, and he looked at the girl, and he goes, bro, if you keep drawing me that big, you can write it whatever you want. And after that, <laughs> I, I never asked anybody else's permission. So I did it for WCW Magazine, uh, uh, a little feature called Lashing Out. Yeah. Until Vince bought the company. And then WWE Magazine never really showed any interest in it. JR always showed a great interest in my artwork. He never really found a spot for it, but he was always so encouraging, man. It, it Dude, have really you had a chance so to cool. talk with, not to cut you off, but have you had yeah. another fellow artist in the biz and the tour's really good, uh, even character artist, Jerry the King Lawler. Yeah, I've never had an opportunity to really talk to him about it, man. And ironically enough, it's funny you say that, believe it or not, there is a caricature union. It's called ISCA, International Society for Caricature Artists. And I was a, a member of it. And they had their convention during COVID uh, in Memphis. And Jerry was the special speaker there. And I totally nice. missed it because a funeral came up that I couldn't miss. And so I missed getting to go to that convention. And I've never had an opportunity to really sit down and talk shop from that respect with Jerry. Dude, but, social uh, media. You guys are both on Twitter now, yeah. brother. Make the connection or I'll do it for you. Yeah, yeah. He's a great guy. I, I've done a few independent shows with him back in the day, but we never yeah, had a yeah. chance to talk about, uh, talk about our art. But uh, when I left w, WCW and we started WWE, that's when I began doing them for The Wrestler, which was another PWI yeah. magazine. I had and then also did that. the PWI Year in Review. So mm -hmm. each and every year I would do the year review until that just got to be untenable. You know, I was, it was a, it was a great opportunity for me because when I started out, I was the wrestler who could draw. 
So, so the, the bar wasn't very high, right? Yeah. Was Nowadays, you got like a Dexter Loomis, who I don't know if you're familiar with what he did in NXT. Uh, uh, he's done some shit in Impact. I forget his his other name in Impact outside of the WWE, but he was Dexter Loomis. And he, same vibe. He had like a Patrick Bateman psycho, American psycho vibe, but he yeah. drew. He always like, and they showcased his artistic talent. I'm not talking about like a, a Jeff Hardy who no knock to him, but all he does is just paint and shit. Like this was legit, like artistic, like drawing pictures of the boys or yeah. designing a pay-per-view thing. Like he's the only other guy I can think of besides like you and Jerry, the King who have like that. I am aware of, I don't want to throw myself too far under the bus. Right. It hurts, you know, but same thing. And it's just, dude, it's amazing. And as far as when you look at like inspiration, I know you mentioned like, mad magazine which i'm a huge fan of and if anybody you know mad magazine you know mad magazine you used to be ec comics which was the That's prior right. of tales from the crypt and the vaults of Absolutely. horror and some of my yes. favorite like bill Gaines like, joints back then yes yes dude i to this day and my my 15 year old son he's been collecting mad magazines even old school ones for probably 10 years now since he was a little kid he always enjoyed them you know it's like just this thing well, let me, I'll, I'll tell you this, man. This is probably over with you then. And even if other wrestling fans who watch this won't care from a wrestling fan standpoint. But uh, what really helped me go to the next level, because, again, I was just a wrestler that could happen to be able to draw a little bit. So it was very forgiving if I was an overly professional. But I got a little bit better and got a little bit better and doing it over the course of 10 or 15 years. You know, I polished up my style a little bit. And when I stopped wrestling and I had more time on my hands, I started connecting with other caricature artists online. Again, just, I admire your work. Can you give me any pointers? What do you think? And they go, wait a second, is this Lash LaRue? And I go, well, yeah. I didn't realize how many caricature artists were wrestling fans. And so they'd want to talk wrestling with me, and they'd let me talk caricature. And one of the guys that I connected with was Tom Richmond, who became the guy in Mad Magazine that did all the parodies that were the full-color ones when Mad went full-color. Yeah, yeah. just phenomenal job what a great artist he is man and he he started out as a retail caricature guy meaning having those six flags booths and things like that where they do the the, yeah. the uh, exaggerated deals and so he did a workshop in atlanta uh a few years back and i thought you know what i'm gonna go to this workshop i'm gonna pay my money i want to go to this workshop see what i can learn from the professionals over about a three-day period well, of course, I learned some stuff from him. But what was even more valuable was I didn't realize I'd never been around other caricature artists. And now suddenly my world opened up because I met these other caricature artists that kind of took me under their wing. And they would book me on events that they were booked in in the Atlanta market, things like that. And that really opened my world up. And that helped me grow and become better and better and better. And, you know, it's made me more versatile even when I go back and I do other logos for businesses, because as I've done this art gimmick now for probably 20 years, uh, I've started out paying my dues in art the exact same way I did in wrestling. And I took whatever work I could get. So I've done everything from painting shop windows, you know, for the holidays, yeah, painting signs for businesses to doing logos for businesses to doing t-shirt designs. A lot of people don't know this, but the old misfits and action t-shirts, that they sold the MIA t-shirts. That I was designed. you? That was me directly from scratch, completely from scratch. Nice. Yeah, my, my double L logo that I used in WCW, you know, I totally did that, you know. I had yeah, yeah, my dude. shirt that I wore out to Halloween Havoc. If you watch Halloween Havoc, I, I did a, a t-shirt that said Viva Las Vegas. <laughs> it was just an airbrush t-shirt. <laughs> I do remember that. Who was, uh like, other than that, though, like, you know, we're talking about like comics and stuff. Was there, did you read comics as a kid? Where is there anybody? Cause I see you retweeting like some Alex Ross stuff. And yes. he's one of my favorite artists because that man, he just draws like, and what's in front of you. Like, and it's so real. I've never seen characters look so real than like his drawings and like his paintings and stuff. Like the, the he's worked for everybody, Marvel, DC, you know, image, you name it. Like, so, so, so my problem, my, what my problem runs into oftentimes when I talk to comic book guys is I've never been the superhero dude. So I've never been able to sit down with someone like a Shane Helms who I'm great friends with. And I can't sit there and talk like the backstory on characters and yeah. talk about the actual superheroes and that whole deal because I always 
when I was a fan of comics growing up, it was the artwork always good. If something looked different and looked fresh and looked unique, I bought the comic book, not because I was invested in the storyline, but because the art jumped out at me. Right. So I think a guy Alex like Sam Ross, Keith, dude, uh, if you're yeah. familiar with him, he came up with the Max, and it was always yeah. exaggerated features, and his guys were always, like, just big. Hey, and- same, same thing with, like, Todd McFarlane. When he did Spawn, man, he yes. totally changed the game a little bit. He, he gave comics so a much totally detail. different look. He sort of crossed over from that old school mentality to this new, fresh, glossy type of, of look to it, you know, that that looks so much darker and so much richer than those. And and really, that was an evolution from the days of like Jack Kirby and even yes. Will Eisner, who did the spirit, yes. you know, and that stuff yeah, just yeah, looked yeah. phenomenal. And, you know, I, I was always a big fan of people that could create emotion, not just from the storyline, but the way they drew. Will Eisner was just a master of that. The way that he used blacks and a lot of his, his different just black and white stuff. The Spirit is a beautifully drawn, you know, uh, comic book. And then you can even carry some of that stuff over to comics in general. And I was a big comic strip fan because yes. of that. Guys that could tell a story in that format and comic strips, I really loved because I dug the humor as well. I was more in the humor than I was superheroes. And so when I would see something like Calvin and Hobbes by Watterson, you know, and in some of the landscapes that he would draw that would be similar to a throwback to like Pogo was back in the day, man, that, yeah. that goes way back. And it's just these lush landscapes that you think there's no way you should be able to fit that into a little couple of panels in a newspaper, but they were able to do it. And that always, I admired that. So those were the guys that I admired, Greg. you know, in any good art, man. And, and, and that carries over now into everything that I have an eyeball for. There's an artistic side of me that appreciates good art regardless of the genre. So what I mean by that is it allows me that whether it's comic books or comic strips or paintings or Renaissance oil paintings or if it's illustration from the golden era of illustration with with guys like Norman Rockwell and those dudes and, and Sargent, you know, I can look at all that stuff, Thomas Nash, I can look at those artists and I can appreciate the art for the sake of the art. Same thing with music. I don't care if you're talking about rap, if you're talking about heavy metal, if you're talking about country music, if you're talking about gospel music. I can appreciate the music for the sake of whether or not it's a good music. And it allows me to love everybody from Elvis to Metallica to Eminem to Garth Brooks, you know, and be able to appreciate them differently. You just mentioned Garth Brooks, and this is a good. I like. I like how you're just running the show, and you create these segues. I'm walking through the curtain, brother. Let's go through Gorilla and Rock and Roll, dude. I was just in Cincinnati, brother. I saw Glenn Danzig. I don't know if you're a fan or not. I know he's kind of, you know, with you being yeah. a pastor, he's kind of got some weird vibes, things. But the dude, he was always evil Elvis to yes. me, you know. Like, and he, dude, he just did an Elvis covers album that came out like a year or two ago, and it's it's amazing. And he he gets some real deep cuts, like. Hearing Danzig sing like these Elvis love songs, or it's like <laughs> it's, it's amazing. It's a beautiful thing. I have to look it up. I was in Cincinnati uh, seeing him on uh, this past Saturday. Garth Brooks was playing the same night, dude. So it was just this clash. Like we're in this hotel that's like way overly expensive for what it is, and it's a Radisson, dude. And it's like just I don't even want to reveal the amount because you know <laughs> you guys ain't buying enough shirts for me to really afford that room. So right, right. right. Get to it. Not, not level yet. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> dude, it's just like all these this mix of people. We take this bus to the venue, and the venue it was Andrew J. Brady Stadium or Arena or whatever where we saw Danzig. But it's right smack in the middle with uh, where the Cincinnati Reds are playing, where the Bengals are playing. I think that's where Garth was playing too. And dude, it was just like this whole crazy blend of musical vibes, you know, like metalheads and country music people <laughs> it's weird it's just funny you threw out garth's name because like my old lady was like yeah, yeah I like dancing but I, i'd rather go see garth brooks and i'm like uh, that's, uh, funny. Yeah, that's funny well hey funny garth brooks story i actually a couple of weeks ago i was just randomly going to the gym and i go and i turn on my phone and it pops up uh when i open my xm my serious xm app it pops up this sweepstakes for Garth Brooks tickets, right? Garth Brooks was in Nashville. No more stakes. Chris Gaines. No more Chris Gaines. No more. Please, please, no more. <laughs> uh, I'm the only person that needs that soul patch. But, uh, <laughs> hey, come on, brother. Uh, Don't knock the yeah. soul patch. Yeah. I got it, man. I got it right there. Hell yeah, you do. So, uh, 
So anyway, I, I go, I go, what is this? And it's just a banner. So I hit the gimmick on there. And the only thing they're really asking for is your phone number, your email address, and your name. I said, okay, well, I can, I give them that much just to bypass the banner here. And I put it in there. They then called me the next day. I won the Garth Brooks tickets. And I wound up having a conflict in my schedule. I didn't get to go to the Nashville uh, <laughs> concert there, even though I won tickets to it. So I wound up buying tickets to the Birmingham concert. I've never seen Garth Brooks in concert, but I'm looking forward to it. Dude, I'm sure it's going to be rock and roll. Like, I, I'm not a huge country fan at all, brother. Like, I I, I really enjoy the old outlaw kind of country stuff. Like, yeah, they're real sure. dusty. Like, this dude sitting in the fucking desert on a log by a campfire with his guitar, and he's mad about shooting somebody and losing a bunch of shit in his life. That's the stuff I like hearing, you know, not this. Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Like, let's red solo circle. cup shit. You know, well, here's the thing. Let's pull it full circle and you circle the wagons a little bit. You recognize and you realize that the people that love country and the music that you do love from country are the ones that speak to you and what your personal experiences have been in life, right? Yeah. Like I'm a big any fan. Music. I love a, by the way, I love a story song. Yes, you start talking about any music. I can, I can listen to Metallica play Turn the Page and just go into a different orbit because of the simple fact that it's storytelling, right? There's storytelling involved in that. And it's the exact same thing with wrestling. You know, if something is real, well, and the reason why Garth Brooks has stayed in power all these years later, Garth Brooks, I was listening to when I was in high school and here he is still selling out stadium shows. Same Richard thing with Metallica, that. same thing with all these guys that we're talking about, we're mentioning. And it's because at the end of the day, and it's the same truth in wrestling. If you can put out a product, if you can empty your soul in such a way that it comes off real and it comes off legitimate and raw and true, people have this built-in BS meter. They know right away whether or not something is real and whether or not it's raw and whether or not it's true. And if it is, man, they'll react to it. And that's the reason why it doesn't matter what type of wrestler you are, whether you're the cruiserweight guy or whether you're the big daddy cool diesel guy. Or whatever you do. Yeah, whoever you are, man, if you can come across and do what you do and do it well enough that the people believe it, man, it's going to get over. It's going to get over. And if you if you believe it, they generally believe it as well. You know? Yeah, they got to. And you have to, because like you just said, man, and it's yeah. a beautiful thing when it all comes together. Hey, as we wind down here, I want to know what currently are you watching? If anything, in on a major, I guess, level scale of professional wrestling. All right. Full disclosure, up until about maybe a year and a half, two years ago, I wasn't watching any product at all. Really? Totally lost interest in it. This goes back to what we were talking about, about putting your finger on the whole pulse of culture thing. And now I totally start getting sucked more into it. From the clips, I watch a lot of the ECW clips that come on YouTube. I see a lot of the impact clips that come on YouTube. I see a lot of the WWE clips that come on YouTube. And I find myself feeding my my, my wrestling appetite more off of these quick segmented clips. Yeah, like yeah. That because I just don't have the time that I used to have to sit down and watch Brother, a total show. Social media, we all open. consume so on the go yeah. now, you know? Yeah, so I'm able to, to digest more of it. That What I love about the product all the products I see put out there now is I see this versatility going on, right? And I yeah. think that's healthy for the business. Now, I have a natural affinity. I don't know if other people feel this way. I don't know if the AEW crowd out there is going to get mad at me for saying this or they're going to embrace this. Ooh. But when I watch AEW, man, it just I, – I, I get those old WCW feels. Yes. They, it's got kind of the old vibe to it. And Brother Tony Schiavone's voice is on TNT and TBS. Oh. But, you know, but, but here's what's crazy about that, man. What's crazy about that, Juice, is you can make the same argument if you want to about it. It's JR's voice, and he was the voice of yes. all for 20 years. Yes. But for some reason to me, the overall vibe of the show feels more WCW than WWE to me. Yeah. And just the way that it's structured, the way that it it's It feels produced. like the revenge to me. I always said it's like hey, right. revenge. I always yeah. said, like, the day that you guys folded and they bought, I was like, you know what? At some point in time, I always thought this. This is shoot. This is for real somebody someday they will get their revenge you know and i'm just i i didn't really truly believe it happened but that's what i felt should happen dude and it's i feel like it's kind of happening now you know at least a little spanking like a a smack in the face like wake up you know you guys are putting on some booty it was 
if nothing else, if nothing else is fun and it's awesome that there's this alternative out there. That yes. To to it. So I love the fact, I love what AEW is doing. And I think they're putting out a strong product and a very good product. I think that they are, are following things in the right direction. You know, um, they're listening. I, I'm, the I, yeah, that's exactly right. They're listening and talking to the crowd. No, yeah. but you know, yes. and I'm, and I'm growing, I'm growing to appreciate WWE more and more and more. Um, but at the same token, what's more intriguing to me, just from a business standpoint, and I haven't really heard anyone speak about, about this either, but it's intriguing to me to see the smaller promotions that are doing more of a studio style show, like the old Georgia Championship Wrestling. Yeah. And you see that with with uh with Billy's NWA. NWA, yep. Right? You see what the NWA is doing, and and you certainly look. I think it's Jeff Jarrett that said says it all the time, you know, where you can, you can either be, you can either be greater than, less than, or different than, you know, AEW is different than WWE. There's no question. I don't think anybody, and I don't mean to knock their product. NWA is, is less than, but they're not trying to compete on that level. I think it's smart that they're finding the niche that they're finding and they're finding success and there's money to be made in that. And the point that I'm making by saying all that is totally okay for that to be your niche. And I could see more promotions popping up and utilizing streaming in such a way and utilizing that old studio feel to it in such a way that to me, that's the modern day territory system. Yeah. Right. Yes. yes. So, he gets it. So, 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 he gets it. Yeah. yeah. So back in the day, back in the day, you look at Memphis would look totally different than Georgia championship wrestling would look yes. totally different than the continental would look totally different than mid South and look totally different than, then a world class and yeah. it looked totally different than Portland. All those things were unique and they were territories. And I could see people utilizing streaming services as wrestling, you know, enjoys this resurgence and utilizing that to everybody had their own little niche, their own little feel, and let people choose their flavor, man. Some people like Rocky Road, some people like cookies and cream. Let them decide what they want. Glutton, I like them both. Yeah. And here's the great thing about it is. My generation really didn't have a choice. You, you're going to watch whatever territory you lived in the territory of because that's what you got locally. This is not limited to location. It's almost like being able to syndicate yourself. So yeah. come up with a unique packaging. What makes you stand out and stand apart from everybody else? Get you some unique talent in there. Find your niche, man. Start a streaming service. You've got a promotion. And don't try to compete with Vince. Just try to make money. Yeah, dude, a you lot know, of that's what was, the independents are fun. nowadays. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and I, I love it. I love it. And, I, and, and that, that allows you also to to utilize a revenue stream without having to rely on how many tickets can we sell? Because people aren't doing live events like they used to do. They're just not. Yeah, for sure, man. Uh, dude, and, and like I said, the, the independent scene we got in Chicago, we're spoiled with it because there's like AAW, Warrior Wrestling, uh, Northwest Indiana, we have Black Label Pro, all of them running either via Fight TV, uh, IWTV, Independent Wrestling TV, and all these crazy streaming services. And imagine if that's something that was around back in the day, you know, when you guys were doing this. It's just, it, it's crazy it, it's how the business has evolved. And to be able to, like you said, feel that buzz again, which we've been feeling now for a few years. When I started this show, my whole pitch to Sretton was like, dude, there's some shit going on. There's these guys doing some shit in Japan and in the States. And it's it's hitting me hard, dude, as a pro wrestling fan. And I've never tuned out. Don't get me wrong. I've been disappointed. You know, I've I I used I'll put you this way. I went from having 10 friends at the house to watch when Raw came on to none. It was just yeah. me, myself, and I. But you're still watching. <laughs> you're still watching. But I still watched it, you know? Yeah. And so to feel the buzz that's going on nowadays, I was like, hey, dude, something's, there's this fucking freaking nature and it's about to swell. Yeah. And he jumped on board, dude. And we've been able to be a part of it, someone, talk to so many great people. And now, including you on that uh, just epic list, it's, it's awesome. And, Dude, I really thank you for being able to share your knowledge and your opinions on everything. I think uh, this is something we're going to have to do again because there's just so much um, I could talk about with you. Like you're one of those guys like a uh, shout out to guys like TJP who come on this show and just spread a wealth of knowledge uh, about the business in, in a very positive way, you know, because 
I, I hate to hear anybody that's you could be jaded from the business for whatever reason, but to like, you know, go on any form of media show and just like ah, shit all over everything and have a horrible perspective on stuff that to me, you know, says you got a lot to work on yourself. But so sure, what I'm absolutely. saying, brother, is I appreciate the positivity tenfold because that's what we try to generate. And yeah, we all have some hot takes and hot opinions or whatever, but what you provided for our audience and for us tonight was invaluable, dude. And I, I really appreciate that. So brother, we're going to have to do this again. I think we uh, turned this into a two parter anyways, which is rock and roll. Yeah. Works for me, man. I've enjoyed it. I appreciate you giving me the opportunity, man. Give me the platform. It's fun for me to talk about it again after so many years away. You know, like I said, I was a social media man. I was, I was a ghost on social media just anywhere. For 12 years, people couldn't even know. What I always happened. wonder what happened to you. Like I said, I last remember like the TNA a little, and that was brief, right? When they first started, you, you doing yeah. something with them. And then it was like, what the hell, you know, quick, quick story. I, I did an independent show, man. And I was, I was getting a lot of injuries that were just accumulating and, and also just losing my passion. You know, I, I, I'm glad that I stepped away from the business before all that jadedness and all that bitterness set in. Mm -hmm. um, because it's easy to take this business personal. You put so yeah. much personally into it. You, yeah. And then it takes you some time of sitting back from away from it to go going, you know what? I, I took that stuff way too personally and I should yeah. not. Have business it. doesn't it's, owe you anything. It's what you put right. into it. That's exactly right. So, so I'm, I'm thankful that I had that perspective, but I could feel that stuff mounting and I wasn't finding a lot of success you know, independence. Again, like I told you before, man, I, I wasn't really furthering my career. I was getting in horrible shape because my body felt terrible. I did a well, show. You look like you got your great shape now, brother. Flex those guns well, real quick. I, I, hey, <laughs> the funny thing about it is <laughs> uh, went, went into uh went into an independent show here in Alabama and I was wrestling Bull Buchanan that night. And Bull and oh, I nice. wrestled, yeah, several times and we we're the main event. I knew I could have a good match with him. And I walked up to him and I said, hey, hey Barry, uh, I'm retiring tonight. He goes, yeah, sure, man, whatever, you know. And I come up like right there on him, you know. And uh, and I said, no, no, I really am, man. I think this is it. He said, oh, okay, whatever. So we went out. We had a great match, good match, boom, decent crowd. When it was all said and done, I didn't cut a promo. I didn't make a big deal out of it. I rolled out of the ring. I have not ever been in the ring again since. And that was about 2010. And uh, – the closest I've come to being around, even being around the wrestling business since then, before I started doing the Tom Limit Crawl podcast, was um, about two years ago, they brought Arn in to Alabama to put him in the Alabama Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame, and he did a workshop that morning. And uh, I asked the guys that I knew the promoter was doing it, I said, I don't really want to come to the show, because if I do that, fans are going to see me, they're going to start speculating. Yeah, they're going to start asking me about being in the wrestling business, that whole deal that's going to be on social media. And I was, still was not on social media at the time at all. And I didn't want that kind of stuff. And they said, just come to the workshop, man. Come during the day when he's training these guys. And so I went and got to see Arn for the first time since WCW. And thank him for all the help he gave me then and told him how much it meant to me, uh, him, him taking time out with me as a young kid. Uh, saw Barry there. I saw Big Bull Buchanan because his son is kind of breaking into the wrestling yep. business. Son's a big yoked up dude too, man. I mean, he's great. Got a good heart about it and everything. So he brought his son so he can learn some stuff from Arm. So I see him across the way, and I had not seen him, man. Like I said, ten years. And he goes, "What?" So I go, "Hey, man, went up, hugged him, you know." And he goes, "Dude, where you been? I ain't seen you in about ten years." I go, "I told you I was retiring." He goes, I thought you were ribbing me. He goes, That's a long rib. <laughs> that's a long rib. That's a long rib. So so, yeah, yeah. So that's the way I rib, man. I rib. I just go all out for the dude. Long term storytelling yeah. is the best. Yes, yeah, it's the best. So the best. But you know, yeah, and, and I don't have such a hard and fast rule anymore. And, and you know, I've learned the older I get with wrestling, you never say never, sort of thing. And it's ironic because when I stopped wrestling, I hit forty in twenty sixteen, and I had, had when I left wrestling, I'd had these teeth knocked out. I had a compression fracture on my lower back, two herniated discs, a ruptured disc. Uh, but I never had to use surgery on anything. I had 34 yeah. concussions, but I never, I was thankful. And, and I, even my back, I didn't ever have to have surgery on or anything. And I turned around, man, I was 316 pounds. Holy shit. When I was ordained into 
ministry uh, and bought a suit for that. Give you some perspective. My suit was a 46 waist and a 58 jacket. That's wow. how big I got. Yeah, I look how, like and how tall are you for shoot? I'm right under six foot. I'm about five eleven and a half. So um, I look like one of those Russian nesting dolls. <laughs> <laughs> All these Nacho like, Libre I look books. Like Lash, Russian nesting Lash, dolls. You know? <laughs> and so I said, you know what? Uh, this is not sustainable. I don't want to live the rest of my life like this, man. And yeah. so. I started, I started cutting back and just, I knew what to do and I knew how to train. And I thought if I get my flexibility back, then I know I'm going to feel better. And dang, man, if I did not just totally, I feel better now than I felt my twenties. And that's been a several years journey since then. But I went from 316 pounds down to about 211. Nice. Now about, I'm about 234 now, you know, and I'm leaner than I was at WCW. I got abs for the first time in my life, you know. <laughs> So I, I hit the gym every day, uh, make it a big part of my, my training regimen. I eat right. I take care of my body. And it's funny because now, again, perspective being what it is, even though I'm from that era, you know, from the late 90s and from that golden era of the 90s wrestling, yes. and people remember me from back then. And, and even though I've been retired now for 12 years, I'm 45 years old. You know, I'm younger than Batista. I'm about the age of <laughs> yeah. guys like, you know, I'm just being honest. I, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm around around the age of um, of AJ Styles, you know. Uh, I'm younger than I'm younger than Edge and Christian. Did you ever get guys. to work AJ in WCW? Because he came yeah. in late. Yeah, I had one of his dark matches there at the beginning when you know, as a matter of fact, I had a dark match with him when they were talking about hiring him. And I don't remember they actually hired him from that or not, but um, it was there towards the end. But yeah, AJ was always a great, and AJ and I also had a very close um, bond there from the beginning because he's a believer and a Christian as well. Right, and, right. And when I was talking earlier about going up to South Bend, Indiana in the early 2000s, he was going up there and wrestling for them as well. And so we would see each other up there for that little promotion. So nice. AJ's a great guy. I think the world of AJ. In fact, just today when I came home from the gym, I had all my old green baseball shirt green and white phenomenal one baseball oh, yeah. shirt that he gave me about 15 years ago so nice dude yeah aj's yeah. dude he's he'll go down as i he's like that you know generations like sean michaels you know you hear it a lot but it's 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 a good dude he's the best worker i think really to come out of that generation you know yeah he's tremendous talent just an unbelievable talent now he's the talent that always uh tried my best to be like you know that's that's the way i wanted to be i wanted to be that guy that could be a high flyer and still be a good mat wrestler and still be thick enough and big enough that I could do a lot of those uh power moves you know when i needed to uh one of the one of the few guys back there in the late, late 90s uh that was doing that lucha libre style at the time that, that wasn't already mexican so you know that kind of gave me a it kind of gave me my first foot and, and toe into wrestling there is just uh that that gave me my my breakout for lack of a better way of putting it right on lots of matches who would you say um when this because i want to give you a moment to you know promote what you have going on where everybody can sure. find you and where we can get more connections and hook you up with maybe some more of the homies that would like to talk to you but i would like to know in your most humblest of opinions all-time favorite wrestler, and who do you think is the future, the absolute, like, this is the guy that you're aware of right now, and he's just killing it, and he's the future of the business? Hmm. It's hard for me to answer the future of the business question only because I feel like I have not been immersed in the product enough to be fair to everybody. Although I do like what I've seen with guys like Hangman Page and MJF, a lot of these young guys that are getting an opportunity there in – um and AEW, I think, are doing a phenomenal job in killing it. Um, you know, same way, I've always been a big Finn Balor fan for whatever, you know, reason why I Prince see Devitt. him. Yeah. Yeah, his style is different, man. It's different, and it resonates and looks different. Randy Orton, I think, is going to be the next crop of legends. I realize he's not considered a young guy anymore, but he's another one of those kind of guys that came in a generation right after me that yeah. I think is going to be his generation's uh, Shawn Michaels slash Undertaker because he's got the longevity and the staying power. The other reason why it's tough to answer that question is because there's a certain element too of that ne next person 
that is the guy, the pivotal guy, isn't always who you think it is because it takes time to build that up too and build that credit kind of credibility. Who's going to stick around that long? You know, um, give you an example of what I mean by that is the Undertaker is an absolute legend, Hall of Fame guy, unbelievably talented guy to be such a big man. But would we still feel that way about him or would we just feel like he was a gimmick if he had a 10 year run and, and, and WWE or anybody else cooled on him and quit using him and for whatever reason he went off into the shadows. Uh, he, to his credit, he was able to continue to evolve his character and change his character and have such longevity that the longevity I think is what has made him as much of a legendary status as it is the character of the undertaker in the first place. I've learned the older I get, it takes some special sauce to have that longevity. And I say that as somebody who, by my very token, my, my personality is the type of person. I'm a loyalist at heart. When I set my mind to something, I put myself all in it for as long as I possibly can. And yeah, I looked at my career and my career did not really have that much longevity to it. You know, it, it ended way earlier than it probably should have. Um, and that's something I care a lot of weight with because of it. So I think longevity has a lot to say for whether or not that talent stands out and stands the test of time. Yeah. Uh, somebody that I have in mind when I'm making that point is someone like a Bray Wyatt. I hope to see Bray Wyatt come back to wrestling because with his pedigree and with me knowing personally what guys in the his family. Yeah, the, the Wyndham's. Barry yeah. Wyndham. The Wyndham's too, the, yeah. For the, for the kind of talent that he comes from, man, uh, you know, I would love to see him, and I, and I like to tell myself that he's just strategically waiting his time to kind of move back in because he's so creative on top of being so talented and on top of just having such there, – there's sky's the limit on his ability. But then you ask yourself, has somebody like that become bigger than the business? And yeah. is he going to go off and do something else? Fair you enough. Know, uh, Brock Lesnar, in a lot of ways, became bigger than the business. The Rock. Oh, yeah. Sure. The moment he won that UFC title. Yeah. So, so, you know, you, you don't know who that next generation guy is going to be because you don't know what kind of longevity they're going to have. Greatest of all time, though. We're going old school. This is the easy answer question. Uh, well, here, here's the problem is, is, again, it goes to where are you going to put the priorities? Okay, if you put the priorities on the total package, the complete package. Not Lex. Yeah, if you put, put on the complete package, I don't think anybody can argue against Ric Flair just because you add the longevity, you you add the, the promo skills, you add the work ethic that it took for him to be the champion that he was with the traveling champion, for him to be able to have matches, great matches with anybody at any given time. But then again, if you ask me overall greatest workers, greatest workers up there, I think is Kurt Henning's up there with the best of them. But Kurt Henning gets a little bit of an edge only because Kurt still had this, this great size to him. He's a bigger guy than a lot of people knew that he was. Yeah. He was also very, very, uh, very charismatic. But if you strip all that stuff away and you ask Perfect. me the absolute best pure wrestler that I've ever been in the ring with is Brad Armstrong, bar none. Oh, yeah, dude. I've always heard stories about, like, all those Armstrong boys, dude, man. That, yeah. Yeah. And, brother, there's no – the only right answer is what you truly believe because sure, it's your sure. opinion, you know, like that's a, it's a loaded question. I get it. And oh, I know. You know, but can you I, imagine, can you imagine being, being in the family of Bob Armstrong, Brad Armstrong, Scott Armstrong, Steve Armstrong and Brian. And then, and then they, they get asked, who do you think is the best wrestler? And they go, Brad Armstrong, bar nine. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. For them dude. to feel like they're not even close to him. It just yeah. shows you how amazing Brad was. He was all jacked. He was jacked to the guild too, man. Back in the day, yeah, he was yeah. great physique, man. Brad was he was a great guy, such a humble guy. And I'll tell you a, a, a secret on Brad Armstrong. Brad was every bit as funny and charismatic as what people see in Brian. And Brian would tell you this too: every bit as funny. You get him backstage. And man, he would have the entire locker room in stitches all the time. But for whatever reason, could never carry that over to the ring. And, I, and Brad and I traveled together. He was like a brother to me. And those Armstrongs just took me under their arm, under their wings. So I'll be the first to, to say I'm extremely biased when it comes to them. But uh, Brad, I even asked him one time, you know, why he was not able to be what he was out in the ring in yeah. front of the camera, what he is backstage. Because 
if he was, man, that, that dude would just been a, a top guy. And he just, he told no me, doubt. he goes, last look, I came in at a time, brother, when it was considered serious. And I was, if you were a baby face, you had to be serious or people wouldn't believe you. And he just did not know how to not be serious when he's presenting himself as a wrestler. He took it as serious business, you know. I dude, I love that though. I I hope that one day MLW, if you're familiar with Major League Wrestling, they kind of they try to do it. Um, you know AEW tries to put that on too. But I hope one day we do get a company that's like presents wrestling as serious as it can possibly be presented with everybody knowing what it is. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like the most pure athletic version of it. Obviously, you have to have. To me, the story's in the ring. But yes, it's like that boxing thing or whatever. You got to have the hype. You have to have the hype because hype sells fights. You know, like I just I want it more pure. You know. So how do you how do you bring it back around? How do you bring it back around? For where's that? Don't how know. about this? How about this for a storyline, right? If you ask Lash Larue, Lash, if you're coming back and you're making a comeback, if you said, "I want my damn son in a one more run," because I ain't done, because I ain't done, unless in a bon ton roulette, I ain't done. If you ask me, if you ask me how I would bring myself back out in the wrestling, I would write a storyline where I said, "You know what? I'm just happy to have a job. This is entertainment." Man, and I realize these are all entertainment companies. And man, oh, you want me to get beat tonight? Hey, no big deal. Whoever to pin me, pay me. Let me go out there and they put the guy over. You know, whatever it is, however you want to do it. Until they start making such fun of me, or calling me the old dude, or pushing me to the side, or treating me like a job, or being disrespectful to me to such an extent that I get so hot and so mad about it that I make it real. And then I blur the line and I go out there and instead of having entertaining matches, I turn it on and I'm intense and I'm mad and I'm, and I'm, you know, I'm ticked off and I'm making it real again. And now all of a sudden what you've done is all you have to do is plant that seed of doubt because the wrestling fam. Yes. Believe they yes. want to believe uh, when, when Goldberg hit it big, that you can say what you want to say about his wrestling ability, our people would stop me all the time when he was at his height and they go, look, I know wrestling's f but when Goldberg speared that guy, that was real, wasn't it? That's all you're trying to elicit. That's what you're trying to accomplish. I, you did it last, you did it, you dropped the F-bomb. I, I totally agree. I totally agree with that, by the way, but you dropped the F-bomb, so you will be censored on that one. I just have to let you know beforehand, but it's all good, brother. We Which still one? love you. Yeah, Bob, I can't say it. It's illegal terms. Hey, WWE has their verbs they can't use, and we have ours. Got it. You know, <laughs> keeping it cafe. You, yes, sir. <laughs> well, brother, dude, I, I sincerely appreciate all the time, man. This has been a blast. Like I said, I would love to do this again whenever you're down, man. And hopefully, maybe you get the bug or the itch enough to just, you know, kind of start testing the waters. Maybe, you know, have you ever, have you ever been, you haven't even jumped in a ring in, what'd you say, over a decade? Dude, the closest it's come is this, that when I was telling the story, I was telling you earlier about Arn Anderson. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, when he was running that workshop, I just stood on the outside of the ring and he was, he was talking to them about punches. Like we were talking about earlier. Yeah. And I, I was kind of making the similar point to what I was just made with you guys. And, and I said, you mind, Arn? He goes, no, please, go right ahead. And I said, well, it's when you do it. I said, I, I slid in the ring. I said, let me show you what I mean. And I threw a couple of punches that way, you know. And I may have taken one bump, but that's as close as it's come. Um, oh, did, did, did it, you didn't get the goosebumps? You didn't get Oh, 100%. 100%. And I'll be honest with you, that's the reason why I've kind of kept myself reined in is because I've always been that mentality in my mind where, it's the same reason why it took a long time for it took two years for them to talk me into the podcast. And it took me even longer. You know, I, I've, I've never done a convention in my life. Mm. I've never done just an autograph signing. You go, well, you just sign an autograph. You're not taking bumps. I'm an all or nothing mentality guy. It's hard for me to dip a toe in without being all in, you know, and that's the way my mentality has always been. And I feel like, man, I get back in the ring. 
I cannot go unless it's going to be at the highest level that I can possibly try to achieve. I'm not saying that I'm that guy that I can just walk in and, and I'm going to be on a, on a main stage again. But i tell you this, I couldn't be in the wrestling business and not try to be. And I couldn't be in the wrestling business without saying, give me the microphone, let me cut a promo. You know, Lash LaRue, the raging Cajun is back. You know, I could not be that guy. I'd want to throw yeah. the Mardi Gras beads. I'd want to list that a ball ton roulette. I'd want to pull a little victory <laughs> over my left shoulder, a little bit over my right shoulder, get my mojo working. And woo, Mr. Mojo rising. You know, so it would be hard for me not to go that route. And because of that, I've purposely kept myself distance because there are things in my life that's extremely important to me. You know, my right. faith is extremely important to me. And for sure, the things that I do now to give you an example, I, um, I am the associate pastor at my local church. I'm the chaplain and assisted living facility here in town. And I've been there long enough that they had asked me to be the director of chaplain services for all their facilities. So those are the things I do from a ministry standpoint. I work a lot with youth because of that and everything else. Now, now I can tell you that that doesn't pay a fraction on a weekly basis of what I make a, for a couple hours work of doing caricature work because that's so specialized and so good and so niche. And yet I'll turn down a lot of bookings for my caricature work because I have other obligations that I consider in ministry that are more important. And I know it'd be hard for me to be on that level in wrestling without having to step away from ministry for a while. And that's what's kind of kept me. Uh, that's what I struggle with. That's my inward struggle now, man, because I don't want to ever come off selfish and selfishly go after wrestling one more time. Hey, man, more. but do it. Like I said, I'm going to shoot back to Nacho Libre again. Yeah, dude. I mean, it's based on a true story. Do it for a good sure. cause. Go back into wrestling and whatever, you know, you could do to help out with, you, you know, your your church or whatever you're doing. You can find a way to make it work if you get that bug. I'm not trying to pressure you into anything. I'm just saying. Well, I'll just put a hood on and wrestle as Mardi Gras. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. It's 2022. What the hell you want to do? Come on. Let's That's right, brother. Let everybody know right now where they can find you at on social media, where they can book you and or maybe get some artwork sure man the best way the best way is to hit me up either dm me at lash can draw which is my twitter handle lash can draw or you can email me how's this for old school lash wcw at aol.com i that is, love it i love it if you've got any of the old the old uh wcw magazines from way back 97 98 99 I would put my email address on every cartoon. It's still the exact same email address from them. <laughs> Last WCW at AOL.com. I've never changed that thing. That's dude, my respect for that, because it, it took me through a time warp and I was just like, yes, this feels right with yeah. the world. I feel comfortable again. <laughs> this dude's bona fide and legit. This <laughs> WCW and AOL. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. Is AOL He's still committed around? to the gimmick. He is really committed to the giving. It's the only place in the world where the merger worked. Was in my email address. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And yeah, dude, yeah. Lash, That's brother. the one spot. The one spot where it actually got over was in my email address. <laughs> That's so awesome. Brother, I can't thank you enough. Once again, man, this has been an absolute honor and a pleasure to talk to you and to share your stories. Um, dude, everybody watching and listening right now on youtube make sure you hit like and subscribe be sure to share with your friends be sure if you're listening any podcasting platform spotify twitter or wait not twitter you can't facebook they just canceled the podcasting the audio i don't i don't get it but anyway spotify stitcher iheart radio all that stuff google podcast we're everywhere make sure you rate and review share with your friends buy some t-shirts ProWrestlingTees.com forward slash JP Dub Tees and support the show because we're really po and we like to continue to be able to talk to awesome people like Lash LaRue and make sure. Yeah, I was not cheap, it. guys. I was not cheap. Was not cheap. No, man. It's, it's, <laughs> I can't pay for my poison ivy treatments. Yeah. yeah. I'm running yeah. from the inside. Yeah. Oh, can a brother, get, can a brother get some prednisone? <laughs> And if you guys are on Twitter and you don't follow Lash LaRue, then 
I'm going to send you some hate mail. It's just, it's what's got to be done because he's yeah, awesome. I'm a little embarrassed that I'm, that I'm under a thousand followers. Well, you just started back on that. I didn't even yeah, know you were on. I, brother, I don't even know. I'm trying to think like I saw you on Twitter. I was like, holy shit. Like there he is all these years. I've been, I'm like, where the yeah. hell is last? I'm still trying to figure out how to get verified. <laughs> so is Buff. And he's got yeah. like thousands of people and they're like fuck this, this is how under the radar i've been if you've noticed like i don't even have any like recent photos of myself on twitter it's just my caricature brother you have an aol.com we talked about this all right yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, i'm still beta on all of it yeah yeah aren't we all thank you guys for listening like i said be sure to share with your friends and spread the word. Spread the good gospel according to juice because it's a good time and we like to lose. Until next time, wet them up, wet them up, wet them up. Wet up. It's all right for Lash LaRue and everything he can do. See you next time. You gonna do sex to me? Did you like that video? If so, be sure to hit like and subscribe and check out more killer content from your boys at Juice Pro Wrestling. Whoa, yeah!